Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you're here and that you're real and present. We ask now for your help. We pray, O Lord, that you'd be with my mouth and that it would speak what you would want it to say, nothing more and nothing less, and be with all of our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our hearts to receive and believe, and a life that's ready to do what you say, so that we don't just hear the word and deceive ourselves, but we do what you say. And so we ask that from this, you would produce many acts of obedience in accord with your word. This is what we ask for and more, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if I were to ask you to think about the word paradise and what comes to mind when I say the word paradise, if you were to close your eyes, what mental images come to mind? What pictures come to mind? I imagine that if we went around and talked about it, you might say things like palm trees and white sandy beaches. You might describe crystal clear blue waters where you can see the colorful fish down at the bottom. You could picture yourself with a drink that has an umbrella in it, and you could see yourself sort of in a hammock or uh, with your foot up and, and reading a book. You could sort of picture paradise. Whatever you might be picturing, here's what I imagine you're not thinking about. I imagine you're not thinking of commuting down 95. I imagine you're not thinking about sitting in a cubicle or writing reports or seeing clients or seeing patients. I imagine you don't picture yourself showing homes or fixing plumbing or preparing lessons or folding laundry or writing code. In short, I think what I'm trying to say is when you think of paradise, most of us don't think about work. In fact, for us, paradise is where we go to get away from work. Paradise is where we go to take a break from work. If we've made it really well, paradise is where we retire when we don't have to work anymore. You see, part of what makes paradise paradise is for us that there will be no work there. The very absence of work is part of what it means for us to have paradise. And this morning, Genesis 1 and 2 would invite us to rethink then our understanding of work. Because in the beginning... God made paradise, and there was work to do. In paradise, in the very good design of God, there was work. We've been in Genesis 1 and 2, and we're going to be in these chapters, and we're looking together at sort of God's original design for the world, how he made this world to be. And today, we're considering work in that world. And so we want to consider together two things, the genesis of work, And second, why your work matters. We want to consider in Genesis the genesis of work, how it began. To borrow a phrase from a a pastor named Tim Keller, he wrote a book called Every Good Endeavor, which I would highly recommend to you. Wonderfully helpful book. He talks about sort of the design and dignity of work. That's sort of what we're getting after here as well. The design of it, the genesis of it, and the dignity of it, why your work in particular matters. So here's the first one, the genesis of your work. If we were to consider together, how did work begin? If we were to open the pages of scripture and say, who's the first worker? What we'd find is that the first person who works in Genesis is actually not Adam in the field. It's not Abel with the flocks of sheep. It's not Cain out farming or Noah in a vineyard. The first person we see in Genesis working is God himself. In fact, in the opening chapter of Genesis, in chapter 2 and the first three verses, would you hear it again? We looked at this passage last week, and just pay attention to the word work. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done. Do you hear it? Over and over again, God's activity in creation is described once and twice and three times as work. Now, we may not think anything of that, but commentators say the original readers would have been surprised to hear God pictured this way. Because all the other creation accounts, the Babylonians had theirs, the Egyptians had theirs, the Canaanites had theirs, all those accounts never would have dreamt of a God who worked. In fact, all those other gods created precisely so that they wouldn't have to work. They made human beings to be slaves so that they could do the work and the gods could rest. But here, God is said again and again and again 
to work. And in fact, the word work here is a word that literally means like a craftsman, like a laborer. In fact, the picture here, the literary picture at least, is of a God who gets to work in the morning, works all day until evening, and then calls it a night. Do you see the brilliance of what I said there, by the way? He literally called it a night. He, you see the dub? All right, forget it. So this God who wakes and, and goes and, and sort of this pattern of working and then calling it a rest and then working and calling it a rest and then six days of that and on the seventh, it's this rhythm that sets up the rhythm for all human life of work and rest, a, a labor, a craftsman. In fact, a God who, at least in Genesis 2, as we read, he gets in the dirt and forms a man as if, if this God had a body, it'd be like he had dirt underneath his fingernails. That kind of God who, who is willing to get into the dirt and willing to work, that's the kind of God Genesis 1 and 2 portrays. So then, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, already we begin to see some of the dignity of our work. Because if it wasn't beneath our God to be a laborer, if it wasn't beneath our God to be a craftsman to work, then we begin to see the dignity of the work that we are invited to do as well. In fact, we even get to see that when this God became flesh, when he became a human being, the craftsman of the universe became a carpenter in Nazareth. And for some 30 years, worked a job, day in and day out. And you can imagine, don't you wonder together what the tables and chairs that came out of that shop in Nazareth would have been like? What would it have been like for the craftsman of the very universe to be a carpenter in Nazareth? The point I'm trying to have you see then is in Genesis, the genesis of work starts with God. No wonder then that when this God makes human beings in his own image and likeness, they are given work to do, right? When God, the worker, makes human beings in his own image and likeness, he gives them work to do. This is what we read in 2 verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then skipping down to 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So the picture here is you've got this creation, this untamed, sort of wild, undomesticated world. And in the middle of that untamed, undomesticated, wild world, God plants a garden. Right? And then in sort of like a cosmic bring your kid to work day, he takes Adam and brings him into the garden and he hires his son. He gives his son, Adam, a job. And Adam's job is to do in the garden what God has done. He's to work it and to keep it. That is that he's got this world now with all these raw materials and this rich resources and this untapped potential. And Adam's job is to harness all of that together and to bring order out of the whole thing, to to cultivate it, to guard it, to grow it. It's Adam's job to take the rich soil and the resources and the material and now have lines of tomatoes and and grow melons and mangoes and so on. It's Adam's job to cultivate this thing, to, to guard this thing. And then the plan is that sort of the blueprint for Eden will be the blueprint for the whole world. That this plan is supposed to go viral And that what they're doing in Eden is supposed to happen everywhere so that the whole world becomes like Eden. That's the plan. And in order to do that, we're going to need more Adams and more Eves. And therefore, that's why God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The idea being the dominion of God as expressed through Adam and Eve. Remember two weeks ago, we said they're God's selim. They're made in the image. Selim, that word of icon or idol. What's an idol? An idol is a physical representation of an invisible deity. And in Eden, you had two idols. Adam and Eve were the physical representation of the invisible God. And therefore, God's rule and reign was supposed to be known through Adam and Eve and through their godly offspring so that through the sons and daughters of Adam, they were supposed to go throughout the whole of the earth and to the edges of the earth, they were supposed to make Eden happen everywhere. They were supposed to come together and form societies and grow cities and develop technology so that all over the world, the glory of God might be known everywhere. Now, all of that will unravel when we get to Genesis 3. 
But at least here, what I want you to see is that in God's original design, work was a part of life in paradise. That as soon as the Bible starts talking about anything, it starts talking about work. Which means then that work wasn't a result of the fall. It didn't come after sin. It's not a necessary evil. But rather, work is wired into how God made us. You see, in Genesis 3, when we get there, we'll see how sin cursed work. So that now, like all of us know, on a Monday morning, we can sense together the thorns that choke out the joy of work and the thistles that grow, making our work feel futile. And we can sense together how our work is now filled with sweat and pain. It's by the sweat of our brow that we earn our living. We get all of that. And we also get, as we get to Genesis 3, there's a promise of one who will do a work to redeem all of work. But now in the garden, here in this perfect paradise, I simply want you to consider there was work to do. That work is intrinsic. Whether you get paid for it or not, it's intrinsic to all of us as human beings that we all want to do something meaningful. It's why we struggle with unemployment. It's why, for example, even if tomorrow you were given a billion dollars, you think about yourself, after you've been given a billion dollars, after you've traveled everywhere you want to travel and eaten everything you want to eat and seen everything you want to see, at some point you would even volunteer your time because you can't even imagine what it would be like to not give yourself to something meaningful. Whether you get paid for it or not, all of us have this intrinsic wiring that we want to do something meaningful with our lives. That's because we were made in the image and likeness of our working God. And therefore, work was good. And I would ask you, consider that as you wake up on a Monday morning. That means that when you cultivate a young mind as a te teacher, be thinking of Genesis 1 and 2 and working and keeping it. As you work to exercise dominion, whether it be the manager of a department or of a company, as you bring order out of chaos, like a counselor does, working with the chaos of someone's life, or a homemaker does, working in the chaos of a home. As you do that work, be thinking of Genesis 1 and 2. As you hang drywall as a construction worker, remember our laboring God who got up in the morning and worked and worked until evening, and remember then that there is dignity in your work because work was created good. That's the genesis of work. But second then, the importance of your work. If that's the genesis of all work, what I want you to consider now is the importance of your work. And in fact, if there's one thing I could have you take away from this morning, it'd be this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, would you listen? If you are doing legitimate work, not illicit work, but if you're doing legitimate work, whatever that is, then I want you to hear you are doing the Lord's work. If I could tell you one thing, it's that when the alarm clock goes off tomorrow morning, you who know Jesus Christ, you wake up to do the Lord's work. Meaning when you hear to do the Lord's work, I want you to hear it's not five guys at Seven Mile Road who wake up in the morning to do the Lord's work. We have five elders, or maybe Matt who's on staff, or Katie who's on staff, the people who work for the church, that there's a few of us who do the Lord's work. I want you to hear that when you wake up in the morning tomorrow, you who are doing work are doing the Lord's work. That whether you are an engineer or an electrician, whether you're an accountant or a real estate agent, whether you're a barista or a physician, whatever your calling is, it is work that the Lord God has called you to do. In fact, that very term, calling, vocation, this term was often used in the church, and when we talked about calling, it was usually the priest who had a calling or the monk who had a calling. And yet when the Reformation happened, part of what the Reformers came and said was, no, that's not what we see in the Scriptures. In the Scriptures, it says that all of God's people are now royal priests. You're a royal priesthood, all of you. And therefore, we don't just have one priest anymore. We have a high priest. And that high priest offered himself as a sacrifice. And therefore, what do we priests do? All of us who belong to Jesus Christ. Every priest is supposed to offer something. But because we have no sacrifice to offer, Jesus was already offered for us. 
Therefore, Romans will say things like, therefore, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. Now the sacrifice we priests bring is our whole selves. Our whole lives is what we give to God in response to what he's given to us. And therefore, all of us have this calling. All of us wake up in the morning to do the Lord's work. Now, here's my guess. My guess is that either you don't really believe that, like you're saying, he's just saying this to be nice. Or you might believe it by saying, what he's really saying is if I go to work and talk to someone about Jesus, then it's the Lord's work. And listen, you should talk to someone at work about Jesus. But at least for this morning, that's not what we're talking about here. We're saying that when an electrician hangs a wire, that in itself is the Lord's work. That when a teacher teaches a lesson, when a police officer walks a beat, when a plumber fixes a leak, that you are doing, if you know Jesus Christ, the Lord's work. As I mentioned, that book, Every Good Endeavor, in it, it talks about Martin Luther. And perhaps more than anyone else, Martin Luther thought about this a great deal. In fact, Martin Luther had a phrase. He said that God masks his work in our work. That God masks his work in our work. Martin Luther believed this so much that he would say, the milkmaid who milks the cow, it's really God who milks the cow. I mean, he believed it to the point because Martin Luther, what he did was he reflected on the scriptures. He reflected on the Psalms, for example. And he said, in the Psalms, you find that God is pictured as a provider. God is pictured as a, a protector. And then Martin Luther started to think. He thought to himself, how then does God provide? And how then does God protect? And as Martin Luther thought of this, he began to see the endless number of means that God uses towards those ends. If you've been here at Seven Mile Road, you've probably heard me say this a hundred times now. But it's because once this idea gripped my mind, it so changed how I thought about all vocation. In fact, how I came to appreciate so much of the callings of you here who are a part of this church. Because once you begin to see this way, you can't stop seeing all the variety of ways in which the Lord God is at work. Think of it with me. God could provide food any which way he chooses. He had rained down bread from heaven every single day for 40 years. He easily knows how to give bread. He sent ravens with bread to Elijah. He had an angel show up with hot cakes and water. Jesus took some loaves and some fish and multiplied it for thousands. God has no shortage of means by which he could provide bread. And yet this afternoon when you go to lunch and you bow your head and you give your thanks, how will that meal have arrived? Will it not be that he uses everything from the work of cooks and chefs and restaurants and shift supervisors and cashiers? And, and then if you have your food at home, you think just looking around your kitchen at all the work that went into your meal, all the technology that went into building the refrigerator as it is or the stove that you're cooking on or the flooring that your seats are on or the subflooring or the electricity that you turn on, what endless number of jobs and means and work went into your simple kitchen. I mean, the entire economic industry is involved in simply you surviving, in your su sustaining, in your providence, in your providing. I mean, it's just an endless number of things that we, we never think through. I remember watching this one video of a man who decided that he was going to make a, a chicken sandwich from scratch. And so he was not going to use anything else. He was going to make it from scratch. And so he literally harvested grain, and then he went to the ocean and got salt and strained it, and then he milked a cow and made the cheese and made the butter and, and grew his crops and so on. By the end of this one chicken sandwich, it was six months and $1,500 to make one chicken sandwich. And so when you bow your head to your meal this afternoon, you think of all the means by which God has masked himself to provide for you, so that when you do say, thank you, God, for this meal that's in front of us, oh my, how God is at work in your work. God could protect his people any way he wants. You read in the scriptures, he'll send down hail at times, he'll confuse people at times, he'll send his angels to blind people at times, but so often we live in safe homes and cities. Why? because they're worked by police officers and military and governments and politicians and lawyers and courts and judges and a whole complex of work 
through which God works. We pray for healing, and God can certainly heal. The Lord Jesus could lift a person by his hand and the lame would walk. He would simply think a thought and a centurion's servant would be healed. And yet, the Lord God also chooses to work through hospital administration and staff and PAs and PTs and RNs and NPs and DOs and MDs. Feels like a rap, right? <laughs> Endless number of work. The point is God works for the good of the world through our work. And in fact, I want to say specifically through your work. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then God is at work through your work for the good of the world around you. Luther had this saying where he said, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does. Right? We don't need good works to earn a standing with God, but our neighbor certainly does need our good works. And what if you woke up on a Monday morning when the alarm clock goes off and thought to yourself, what I'm going to is the Lord's work. Oh, how that might change all of us. I was talking to one of our 11th graders just last week, and she was saying that she has this aspiration to study medicine. I told her to study with all her might, to put her whole being into it, because who knows, maybe one day one of these people will be praying for healing, and you may be the mass through which God works. So put your whole being into it. And what if all of us saw our work that way? And if so, then wouldn't we be glad for the endless variety of vocations? Aren't you glad that not everyone has a calling as a pastor or a missionary? When you have a toothache, aren't you glad that not everyone's a pastor? When the check engine light comes on or you need a haircut before an interview, aren't you glad that not everyone's a missionary? Aren't you glad for the endless variety of ways in which God is at work? And therefore, there is no superiority and no inferiority, but all of these are callings by which we do God's work. Because our, our work has dignity, but our dignity doesn't come from our work. Our dignity comes because we were made in the image and likeness of God and redeemed by Jesus Christ. And therefore, any and all work that we do, we can do it unto the Lord. And if that's true, then one point of application for you would be, if all our work is really the Lord's work, then one point of application would be, ought we not do it excellently? If the Lord is at work through our work, ought we not strive to do our work excellently? Let me read you one more quote from Luther. Luther had this great saying. He said, The maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays, not because she may sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Do you hear what he's saying? It's not just by putting a little cross, but rather by doing your work well because God is at work in and through your work. I mean, if all of us went into Monday morning and into this week thinking all that we do, we do for the glory of Jesus, what would that be like? That we want to live for Jesus and work for Jesus. I remember I was either in high school, either 10th or 11th grade, and this preacher came on a Friday night. And he preached this sermon about how we should do everything we do for Jesus. He went on to say, like, even if you use the bathroom, you should leave it in such a way that Jesus could come next. I mean, like, that was stuck in my head. To this day, I'm still scrubbing stuff when I leave a bathroom. Because what if Jesus is next? Like, everything we should do. So I, I remember the next day there was a football game. And I was the center on the team. And that's where they put all the chubby, un unathletic kids. So I was the center. And I had to hike the football. That was my job. And I remember this sermon was in my brain. Everything I do, I'm going to do for Jesus. So I pictured my running back is Jesus. And that linebacker is like the devil. And there is no way the devil is touching Jesus. So as soon as I say hike, I am going to hit this guy as hard as I can. I, he says hike. The quarterback does. I blow this kid up harder than I've ever hit any human being in my life. In fact, the coach screamed from the side, Thomas, that's the way. There you go. Like the height of my life. The... The very next play, I'm not joking, the next play, I'm still blocking for Jesus. I'm blocking for Jesus. The quarterback says hike, but I'm still in the middle of my quiet time with Jesus. And so I forget to hike the ball. We get a penalty, and then the coach goes, Thomas, what the heck is wrong with you? And that was the height and depth of my short <laughs> football career. But listen, I remember as a 10th grader, because I really did love Jesus, thinking, I want everything I do to be for this Jesus. 
And then the years pass, and, and then the thorns and the thistles come, and it chokes out some of that. But what if we went into our world and to our week, going, this Jesus who has done these things for me, I so badly want to live in whatever vacation, whatever calling he gives to his glory, as though he's the patient that I'm treating, as though through me he's teaching this young mind, or though through me he's fixing this house for the good of these people, or through me he's running this company. What if you saw all your work as the Lord's work? And it's not just for a select few, but all of us, empowered by God's Holy Spirit, brought into relationship with Christ, useful and sent out to the world to do the Lord's work. I'll read you one more quote from Dorothy Sayers. She says basically the same thing that Luther does, but hear it again. She says, The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. What if all of us were unleashed into this week remembering that work was in the good design of God. And so whether we're students aspiring towards something, whether we're homemakers, paid, unpaid, whatever vocation it is that God has called you to, it is incredibly good, it's patterned after God, and it's meaningful, it matters, because God masks his work in your work. And therefore, when the alarm clock wakes, up, wakes you up tomorrow morning, you get out of bed going, it's another day to do the Lord's work. Let's pray together. Our God, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your design. And we submit ourselves to it. And pray, Lord, that you might speak to our hearts in, in the precise ways we need to hear that it might transform how we see our lives and our callings and our vocations and the large portion of time we spend in the week. We pray that it might be infused with a vision that comes from you, shaped by your word, so that we might live and be in this world in all our various ways and callings and vocations, uh, living as representatives of God for the glory of Jesus. Come do this and let there be lots of fruit born from these days we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.